what movie did you, you know, watch growing up that kind of shaped your your interest in film? Oh man, uh, Rocky, Deliverance, um, those types of films, The Godfathers, uh, Goodfellas, Apocalypse right. Now was always a favorite. You know, the greats and then the, the not so, you know, the the, the, the semi unheard ofs. You know, recently, uh, two of my favorite independent films are. Uh, have you guys either, you guys, either of you guys ever seen a film called Nil by Mouth? Yep. Great. Yeah, yeah. Fucking number one favorite independent film of all time, right there for me. What's the uh, other one? What's... Chopper. Oh, Chopper. Oh, yeah. Great. Eric Bana's Finest Hour. Fucking yeah. Chopper. I've never. Uh, what the fuck, man? I mean, I've never seen him that good since. Yeah, I yeah. know. He, was... he just killed it in that movie, you know? There's a question that I have for you, though, because I, we followed, my family actually followed your story, because there's an article about you in the South Section of the Washington Post, I think, 94, 95, mm-hmm. that it all the, all, you know, gave your story, you know, that you sold the script, and, you know, ever since then, I was looking forward to the movie. You know, as I know how events turned out, I didn't get to see the movie until it was on VHS one night, Thanksgiving weekend, 2000. And I watched it with my brother. We stayed up till about like 3 in the morning watching it. We were blown away. Because mm-hmm. it's like everything I've seen. But I have to ask you, being this a Boston crime film, were you inspired by like the films like The Friends of Eddie Coyle and things like that? Because it's like a really hyper version of that. Uh, I've actually never seen uh, Friends of Eddie Coyle. That's the first time I actually heard that uh, film title uttered. Who's in that? That's Robert. Uh, that, yeah, Robert Mitchum, Alex Rocco. In fact... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's understandable you never heard it. It's never been out on, on tape. In fact, Criterion just put out the DVD yeah. back in May. So. Yeah, oh, shit, i got to check that out. See, now, this is the benefit of talking to movie geeks right here. <laughs> you guys are giving me good shit to go check. I'm putting that right in Netflix, man. No, no, but I just, the reason I bring that up, though, is because that's like one of these, the Friends of Eddie Coyle is like the quintessential crime novel that, like, Elmore Leonard and all those guys are influenced by, um, by yeah. George B. Higgins. Oh, shit, now I'm and just kind of surprised I've never heard of it. And it's, no, I didn't hear of this until like the mid '90s. Yeah. So it's but, just. And, well, let me ask you this, Mr. Mr. Duffy Troy. And so, you know, and, and everyone knows your, your story. You, you know, you were working at a bar, and, and you know, out of frustration, you decided to start writing. And, and was that that was that your? Did you have that that inkling to be kind of a screenwriter along with the musicianship, or was this? Just something that you know you decided you know I'll give a crack at it. I guess I did. I just didn't really know it at the time. I, I wrote Boondock out of basically out of poverty and frustration and being the victim of crime and seeing crime. And I just had you know a, a friend of mine worked at a at a you know a, um, like a production house and he got me a script. I just copied the format, you know, right. and wrote Boondock. And I was basically concentrating on being a musician at the time. Right. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I saw the movie in my head, and then my agents were at the time were like, hey, do, you, "Do you want to direct this thing?" And and at first, you don't want to be such a presumptuous douchebag. Hey, yes, but I actually stole my opportunity to direct. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Miramax and New Line got in a bidding war over this thing. And they were right. basically throwing the world at me. And at one point, I said, "I want to direct this thing too." And uh, they both stopped fighting for a second, looked at me, said, "Fine," and then went right back to fighting. So that's kind of how I did it, you know. It was literally that 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 ridiculous of a story. And I, I think that um, in this business today, there's no real clear pathway to success. There's nothing that movie geeks can do who want to be in film. Uh, there's no path that they can follow to help secure their chances. It always happens in some weird way, you know. Every every filmmaker I know has got a different story of how they got it done. So mine is that I stole it. Yeah, no, but that's good though because I like we had I was talking to some people this weekend on a short film that we were working on, and they said, look, you know, you may not think you can direct, you can't, you don't know what you're going to be able to do, but if someone offers you the chance to direct, and even not, just take it, because you yeah. don't know what's going to happen. And I think you would you, you have to sort of be like that, especially when it's your baby. You don't want to, you're not going to be happy with like the Spoon Doc Saints was in someone else's hands. Sure, man. I mean, there's definitely a you know, uh, there's definitely a, a blood vibe there. You don't yeah. want somebody else delivering your baby. Yeah. But at the same time, it's it's also a little bit of a daunting task. You know, oh, sure. they were throwing down some pretty big names for direction before I said I wanted to direct it. Mm-hmm. You know, how would how would how would I have felt if you know this this script sold and Martin Scorsese directed it? Well, that's a totally different. 
That's, the total <laughs> that's exactly what I was dealing with at the time, guys. It's not. It's not really that different for me. That's that's right. my history. He was one of the guys that was being uh, tapped to direct this at the very beginning. His name was being sure. thrown around. Right. So uh, it was doubly hard for me to go. Fuck you! I want to direct this thing. <laughs> you know. Right. Well, let me let me ask you you this. So I mean, now it's been a little over a decade, and a lot has happened, and. Boondock Saints, while it did not have, you know, the original, the first Boondock Saints did not have the most, you know, uh, profitable theatrical run, but then, you know, the tape comes out and then the the, you know, the DVD and so forth, and it finds its life on TV and all that. So what have you, what have, what have you learned in that, that intervening 10 years just as, a, I mean, obviously you've matured from then, but what about as a filmmaker in that following, following this up and returning back to this milieu as a filmmaker, yeah, um, a lot. We, we experimented with lots of different things in this sequel: new visual techniques, uh, going into period piece flashbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, spreading my wings a little as a filmmaker, starting starting to pay attention more to certain uh, certain film techniques that you can use, and 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 getting deeper into music uh, and how that influences your film. And it's these types of things that uh over the last 10 years I've you know made notes on in my little black book paid attention to right. and uh brought to the sequel you know uh, I wanted to you know show my growth as a, as an individual filmmaker as well without having it fucking interfere with this story and and this and this and this film right. um, and I, I have to ask um were you cuz it had been a long time since you directed and also because of the film overnight, um, were you was it daunting to come back to the director's chair? No, fish to water. And uh, overnight didn't have the effect on me that a lot of people think that it did. You know, my friends and family were there. They know what right. happened. And these people called me up, you know, angered on my behalf. Right. Uh, and I didn't lose anybody. No friends and no family. They all, everybody returned for this sequel, all the way down to, to uh, crew members. Mm -hmm. That to me speaks far louder than a uh, uh, agenda-filled smear job. Now, how did you know that was going to be like that, though? Uh, quite the opposite. I mean, these two guys came to me right after when when you guys saw that thing in the Washington Herald or Post. Right, the Post, yeah. Um, uh, those two friends of mine came to me and said, hey, we want to do this documentary on you and the guys and everything you're doing. Uh, we granted them the permission they requested, and they basically told us that, you know, don't worry, we're your friends, we'd never screw you. This became their mantra over the three most tumultuous years of my life. We knew they were getting saucy stuff, right. but they were our friends, and we we, we trusted them. Big mistake, Whenever you know. Someone uses that as their mantra. Problem. Yeah, it's it's actually made me allergic to people who say trust me in any situation. Okay, yeah. Uh, I like situations where I don't have to trust the other guy. <laughs> well, and look, well, let me ask you, to, to get back to, to to the filmmaking. Let me ask you this: in that, uh, obviously, you know, filmmaking is all about communicating. And so, what did you learn uh, just on a technical level from working with these actors? I mean, a lot of these actors you had obviously worked with in the first one, but what did you? What had you? How had you changed in the way to communicate with these actors and what you wanted for this second installment? Well, I reserve my passion for the creative side of the business now. An actor's number one complaint, and this is across the board, is when the director doesn't know what he wants. Evidently, on other film sets, everybody's standing around with uh, their thumbs up their ass while a director right. tries to make a decision. That's never been a part of our ball game, and actors appreciate that more than anything. So if anything, there's sort of a dearth of ideas rather than a shortage, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's one of those things where working with actors has always been something I like. You can either do that or you can't. I try to judge each one individually because something, you know, an actor like Peter Fonda is going to respond to different things than an actor like Clifton Collins, you know? Mm -hmm. One's a young sort of hip-hop guy who calls you dog every three seconds and... Uh, the other one's a 60s icon. You have to plan your direction of different kind of actors to fit their style a little bit. That's right. at least my 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 take on it. So uh, in terms of over the last 10 years, it's been a, a process of, of, of learning how to do that, how to judge what how what people, certain actors respond to. 
Right. And and well, and so in the movie, you know, obviously uh, from what I've read, it sounds like the, this production for the sequel, Boondock, San- Boondock Saints 2, obviously went went very smoothly and no no problem. So as, as it's getting ready to, to come in theaters on Friday and then so forth, how are you how are you feeling about this uh, this go around versus the first one? Are you are, are you pleased more this time around than? Vindicated is how I'm feeling. Uh, Boondock One. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this, but it didn't get a release. It was blacklisted from U.S. theater screens because of the Columbine incident. Right. And uh, that was a real blow to us. And now it's no longer a matter of opinion. Had it been released, it would have been a a big hit. Mm-hmm. The numbers over the last ten years tell us that. I mean, when yeah. you've got a movie that's putting up more money every year, it's out on video. Uh, than the successive year before, uh, you, you, you're looking at something that you know this is this has become a financial juggernaut because of this fan base. Right. So in two, I feel like we're getting a shot, the honest chance to succeed here that we didn't get in one. So for me, it's vindication for both films. Are, are there plans to extend? I mean, like as a week by week, it's going to be released in more and more cities. Yeah, actually, that was uh, an idea that we sort of you know. Um, insisted on and luckily the powers that be kind of agreed with us i mean boondock fans found this they weren't advertised to nobody tried to sell boondock to them they found it on their own spread the word on their own so we were looking for a way to the fans to to take part in the success of this film and the only way we could see to do that was to, to hopefully put it in a position to platform itself we've opened it in 70 theaters in six major markets if the fans show up uh, it'll it'll hopefully platform well beyond that. All oh, right, great. And and I guess uh, the last the last question will be in that once once you know once you get this behind you, what's what's uh, what's next on the docket for Troy Duffy? Um, I have written uh, four other scripts over this ten year period, other than Boondock Two. Uh, Boondock Two is in the can. Hopefully, the other four will fall like dominoes if I play my cards right. Uh, next one should be. Uh, a film uh, called The Good King, which is a black comedy. 